Hey everybody, I apologize in advance because this is going to be the equivalent of a three hour workshop jammed into I think 45 minutes or is it 25 something in that 45 minutes. I also realize I'm standing between you and lunch so I'm going to try to make this pretty quick. Um, fear not, there's going to be a lot of text here. It's going to be a bit of a deep dive on a lot of things. We're not going to cover it all but if you want to follow me on Twitter I will post a link to this entire playbook for you. My contribution I'd like to give to you in this giant potluck feast of ideas uh, is for those of you that want to work in this field of longevity, of transformation, of self-empowerment. It's for you CEOs, founders, for you coaches that are looking to make a living out of this. It's kind of uh, a playbook for building the longevity of your business uh, in this area. Mayfield Fund is where I work. I'm one of the partners there. Mayfield is actually one of the first venture capital firms in the world. Uh, so some quick stats. We've been around for almost 50 years. have done almost 500 deals. And these date way back to Atari and Genentech and Compaq and companies way back then, way before I was even there. But you might know us more for some of our companies today, which include Lyft. We were the first investor when they were called Zimride. And back then it was the craziest idea of who the heck wants to get in a stranger's car. Um, I personally lead the consumer practice, and I've been fortunate that some of the investments I've led and been involved in have generated close to two and a half billion of realized market value. So I want to share the patterns and best practices, the tips and tricks I've seen from that. Other companies that are in this world of commerce or consumer or self-empowerment transformation include companies like ClassPass, Poshmark, uh, Lumosity, which is an early pioneer in brain training, saw them ramp up to 100 million in subscription revenues. Um, companies like Trip, which are trying to do consciousness alteration using virtual reality. So you could think of it as a digital psychedelic, if you will. Um, one of the first wearables companies called Basis. Um, Dave Asprey's been a longtime friend, so helping them out bulletproof. Jeff Wu's company, Human, which has distilled ketone esters to help you get the benefits of prolonged fasting with an with a energy shot that could displace things like Red Bull or five hour energy drink. But more importantly, I'd like to share a bit about my story. There's sort of the, yes, I'm from Silicon Valley and sort of venture capitalist, but really I'm just kind of an overgrown geek. And it starts from here. I grew up in this state, Michigan. And in the early 80s, my dad brought home one of these things. And I said, what's that? And he said, it's an Apple II computer. And I said, cool, I want to play games on it. And he said, it's 1982. There are no game companies. He chucked an AppleSoft manual at me and said, why don't you learn to make your own? And that embarked a lifelong love affair with screens like these. I spent hundreds of hours sitting in front of screens like these playing these role-playing games where I'd obsess over maximizing or minimizing statistics of these made-up characters, these alternative personalities that I'd pretend to be. And then it dawned upon me later in life, how come so many of us who play games obsess about these pretend characters when we don't pay the same attention to our stats in real life? Hence was born kind of this notion of, if life is a game, why don't we treat and master it like a game? If we are our own game characters, how would we min-max these? How do we gamify our existence and track these sort of things? My other big obsession was growing up with superhero comics and stories. And what I noticed about them is they always had a unique individual identity that was usually born out of extreme challenge or pain or something that just about killed them. And in coping with that, they figured out their superpower. And what I loved is there was always room in the pantheon for one more. Nobody was trying to become Batman 3. They were all coming up with their own identity, and there was always a new costume or set of tights they could put on that was unique to them. And I loved that the universe could accommodate them all. Um, my other big love, as Mia talked about, was music. And this has been a form of my own identity, but also for me, the magic of mashups. This is one of the bands I perform in called Black Mahal. It is literally a Punjabi hip hop funk collective. So we have the equivalent of George Clinton of doldrums, the uh, older gentleman in the middle. We have the champion battle scratch DJ, freestyle rappers. I played the bass in that. And normally these are styles that would not work together, but somehow we'd lump them all in and we've been able to play the Vancouver Winter Olympics, Montreal Jazz Fest. And it's kind of the magic of when you treat life like a giant potluck festival of different superpowers, you put them together, weird magic will ensue that you could never plan for. So I'm a big fan of that as a playbook. My other favorite place is the Playa at Burning Man. If you've never been, please go once in your life. This is where I like to say this is the most evolved form of our 10-year-old selves before self-judgment, before critics came in. It's where you get to be that alternative superhero character or that video game alternative personality. And what I really love about this, it's how wonderful humanity can be when there's no money, there's no agenda, there's no programming. You are the programming, okay? So the areas of investment I look at, um, range quite a bit. These are literally the future of work, the rise of the freelancer economy, on-demand services, the future of shopping. How are we going to buy things and consume them? Do we have consumers as curators? The future of health and wellness that ties to the longevity theme quite a bit. 
the future of media and marketing. We've all seen what's happened when you hack or weaponize things like social media, and perhaps learning now that free and ad-supported can lead to behavior manipulation that we never anticipated. The future of play, when we can remix our reality, how do we want that reality to look through things like VR, AR, mixed reality? The future of smart homes, who here was a big fan of the movie Her, where Scarlett Johansson is your personal operating system that you fall in love with? Um, or, or Jarvis from Tony Stark's Iron Man house, right? Uh, my favorite growing up was, do you remember in the early Star Trek, Captain Kirk, when he wanted something, he'd just say, computer, and it would just respond. Kind of reminds you of Alexa and where things are headed today. But the bigger picture is trying to look at where we're headed for the future of literally everything from money, capitalism, voting, um, the future of food, the future of death, Really, I think what we're talking about is actually the fate of humanity, and I'll touch upon that in a second. So what is going on? What's around the corner? Is it all gloom and doom? Here's the big trends to watch out for. It's, in essence, this year, we're going to have 10 billion-plus mobile-connected devices. That's more devices than people on the planet. Everything around you, everything in your home, everything even inside you will get connected to the internet, the so-called internet of things. As they grow ears and eyes and brains, they're going to be learning about us, enhancing our reality. Also, we are now addicted to messaging apps, chat. How many of you are on Telegram or WhatsApp all the time? Even more than Facebook, Instagram itself, right? These messaging apps become the new internet, and they know everything that we say. They know all our conversations. This creates this huge digital footprint, this digital exhaust of all our behavior. Something I like to say is that, you know, profile pages is the aspirational self we have. We all like long walks on the beach, we all like puppies and sunsets, but the truth is I could probably get a better love match for you by looking at your shopping habits on Amazon, your adult content search, um, the things that you actually do as opposed to the things that you say you are. And that's the opportunity right here. Where we're headed, so I was a uh, PhD fellowship student in control systems engineering, and control systems is just one big loop, it's a feedback loop. And the theory behind this whole thing is that you observe it, you measure it, because you can't control that which you don't look at. Second is you analyze it. How do you make sense of it? Once you can analyze it, you can start to tweak it, you can write it, you can give some feedback to control it, and then you can improve or optimize it, you can evolve it. This loop is the framework I think of for how we can systematize self-improvement, we could hack the world, hack our environment, um, and this feeds into, I think, the key ingredients for longevity. I was early on a proponent and practitioner of a quantified self. I remember meeting Tim Ferriss at Summit Series, and he had just done a subdermal implant. And I said, dude, what are you doing? He's like, I want to track my biosignals in real time. Dave Asprey, Dan Party, these are all friends who taught me a lot of the practices that Ben had talked about earlier. And it's amazing what you can do when you start to hack your biosignals, right? But the principle behind quantified self also extends to life in general. What happens if you take the same measurement optimization loop and apply it to work? I can analyze all your emails. I could look at the email open rates. I could have AI then help you write your emails better than you could. Quantified play in entertainment. By tracking what you watch, what you read, I might know what to recommend you next. Netflix has built a pretty big business out of that. Quantified commerce and consumption. Amazon knows everything you're buying in real time, trying to suggest, trying to predict what you'll get next. Even attention and intention. Looking at your browsing habits, the YouTube videos you watch, your Instagram, you know, kind of, uh, rabbit holes. How many of you have spent time where you're on Instagram, next thing you know you've looked at 45 minutes worth of donuts and then thinking, oh God, I didn't mean to do that, right? That's because that endless news feed knows what rabbit hole you're going down and feeds you more of it. I even think you can quantify love and relationships. If you look at messaging patterns, frequency, words, you could probably predict when two people are about to fall in love. Quantify home, pet, baby, parent, it applies to everything in life. Sports, learning, creativity, these are all things that can be measured, understood, enhanced. So we're going from simple quantification where you measure things to then using technology to understand it and then help us get better at things. That's my main thesis on this whole area of longevity and the business of it. Really, what we're going to have is this entire digital selfie of your life. All aspects, health, work, money, environment, content. You will basically be a data portrait of your actual behaviors. You know, in the old days, your whole life was summarized in a one-sentence obituary in the paper. You were born this year, died this year, you had this many kids, and that was it. Pretty soon, your next sort of obituary, if you will, could literally be an entire day-by-day, second-by-second 
representation of everything you've ever done, seen, thought, said, texted, etc. That digital selfie will be a composite reflection of your entire life because the behaviors are there and trackable now. Where are the business opportunities for this? How many of you have felt frustration in scenes like this? Or this, or this, or this. These experiences are all going away really fast, and this is where you can make a lot of money by helping get rid of these things, because humans hate now dealing with these sort of long-waiting, forced face-to-face -face kind of uh, cues that we used to suffer with. Instead, you'll have experiences like this. This is an early Silicon Valley startup called Magic, where you literally could text anything and then you would have things like flowers show up to your mom, or you would have a, a car show up to pick you up at the airport. And the thing is, you couldn't tell were you talking to a human, AI, or both. Now, we've gone so far that a startup called Lark has shown that by having a pocket coach, therapist, could be more efficient, have better, better efficacy than actually in-person visits with a therapist for one hour. They just got FDA approval and now can be prescribable. And this is showing better efficacy than live therapy. But why? Why are we working on all this stuff? What's the point of this? This is actually nothing new. For millennia, since time immemorial, human beings have been looking for frameworks to understand our behaviors, to be able to shape them, to figure out which Star Wars figure are you? You always remember those social quizzes, that personality profiling. We've been looking for that for years and years. Actually, I like to say the fortune teller, the soothsayer, is the world's second oldest profession. So it was first about selling you the tea leaves, but really selling you what do these tea leaves mean? What is the interpretation of that? And I would say that, you know, the roots of longevity, self-improvement, were in this so-called self-help industry, the $10 billion of books and seminars and DVDs and workshops. What does that actually get you, though? It gets you a lot of information, but not necessarily a lot of help in getting people to transform. Where is the money behind this? If the 80s were about Richard Simmons and getting people woken up to the notion of physical fitness, if the 2000s were about understanding the fitness of the mind and the importance of mental health, I would say we're headed towards now the fitness of your soul, your spirit. I like to define longevity then as kind of self-development 2.0. This is where we can bring together old meets new, east meets west, sensors in the sensei, tech and wisdom, data, intuition, AI and spirituality. Or I like to even say math meets magic. The formula that I think is kind of interesting is, until now we've had a lot of coaches, we've had a lot of one-on-one -on -one training, but when you can combine that with the always-on, see-everything nature of AI machine learning, combining that together can create this notion of what I call precision wellness, where you've got continuous measurement, remember, tracking everything, but then you can have optimization with coaching. Human coaches that are scaled up by being able to serve thousands of clients at once because they have AI agents working and understanding what's going on that shifts this notion to having an always-on concierge, a curator for all aspects of your life, and being able to supplement that with a tribe, cohorts and communities of people going through the similar challenges and transformations that you're undergoing in all these aspects of your life. It's kind of moving towards this notion here. I just love this movie, Her, where Scarlett Johansson is your personal operating system. It, the vision could be uh, your own pocket angel, you know, on your living on your phone could become your best friend, your lover. It is maybe the technological version of the old mirror, mirror on the wall. But really, at its best, I think it's decision support. And what I mean by that is, we are overloaded by the number of choices that we have to deal with in this world. You go to the buffet at lunch here, you have more calories than you could shake a stick at. You go on Netflix, there are so many shows. I don't know if you have this, but I go to binge watch something, I spend 30 minutes just looking through the choices and never end up watching anything because I couldn't figure out what to choose. Amazon, do a search for red shoes, a thousand pages to search through. It's actually too much. We're looking now to get help with offloading that because every choice you make is cognitive load. It actually tires you out to think about those things, right? So where I think we're going is, if we have this better machine intelligence, it leads to better human intelligence, maybe better humans. It's an area that some of us, like Mikey Siegel, Nicole Bradford, former AFester, has called transformative technology or consciousness technology. There's a whole stack of technologies in this area of human improvement, longevity. Sensors like wearables, data technologies like analytics, there's genetic technologies like CRISPR, where you can edit your genes as simple as copy-paste word document processing now. Chemical technology, smart drugs, psychedelics, material science advances, neurotech, EEGs, fMRIs getting smaller and smaller, accessible to everybody. 
cyber technologies where we're going to be able to hack our wetware, our biology, our neural interfaces. Behavior technologies, this is the ancient wisdom, coaching, social psychology, therapy, group uh, meditations. Um, spiritual technologies fits this as well. These are a combination of human practices as well as cutting edge data, hardware, sciences as well. This does leave us to a brave new world, but it's not necessarily all shiny there. Could we have technology that helps us self-regulate and transcend, help us navigate this world of way too much abundance, way too many choices that we have to deal with? We're moving away from just having the attention economy, the Facebook economy, to what I think of as the story economy. The biggest thing of all is helping people figure out what is your identity, your personal story, expressing it, sharing it, figuring it out. We're going to see the rise of super and transhumanism because of all these augmentations. And maybe, just maybe we're headed towards this notion of a collective consciousness. That's what maybe neo-tribalism is all about. This could also lead to a new cybernetic divide. William Gibson always said the future is already here, just not evenly distributed. What that means is early adopters or, sadly, the rich are the ones who get access to things first. What if we create a divide where you have post-humans and then everybody else? There's a wonderful book I like. It's a science fiction trilogy, which I think is the successor to The Matrix, called Nexus. Um, it's a wonderful read on a science fiction version of this, as well as Yuval Harari's Homo Deus on where things are headed. All in all, though, technology is neither good nor bad. Like all things in life, meditation, drugs, etc., it's just a tool. What matters is the intention and the energy you bring to it. What are you trying to do with it? Give you an example. VR, AR, this could be a wonderful machine for generating empathy and compassion with others. Or if you could hack your perception to be exactly what you want, why would you ever leave it? Maybe a big business opportunity in the future is VR addiction clinics for people who don't want to leave that perfect utopia. So for you as founders of business peoples, you probably often have to talk about um, how you're going to grow your business. You may have to seek funding. You might have to pitch it to investors or angels. When you look for funding, investors, we always say we look for three things. We look for a great team. We look for traction. Is there some sign that there's product market fit? And we look for a big theme. Is there something that could be a huge, massive outcome, this so-called unicorn worth a billion dollars or more? What we're really saying, though, we're looking for good storytelling from you supported with data. Why? Everything in life is storytelling. Fundraising is storytelling, recruiting, sales, business uh, growth, building your communities or making a movement. Even when you sell your company or go IPO, it all hinges on your storytelling ability. And the core of all stories is the hero's journey. If you know Joseph Campbell's template, every story is the same meta story. There is a reluctant hero, gets thrust into a magic world, gets mentors, enemies, faces an existential challenge, figures out some way to deal with it, and is transformed and returns home. This is the prototype for every business, every self-transformation journey, every tribe has to go through this. This is actually the core of every good business. It's the core of every good life, actually, to me. So think about you when you are designing your product or service. Are you engineering a player's journey, a hero's journey for your user, that they go from being a newbie to becoming onboarded, they become a regular, and then someday they become a leader or elder? If you can architect that, it's a wonderful way to look at how your user advances over time. In fact, game designers even build this into how they architect products. There's the onboarding phase for newbies, there's habit building loops, and there's even a mastery level when you become a guild or team leader. So you can bake that into your service. My friend Nir Eyal writes a wonderful book on habit design, and it's all about trigger theory, which is that you have to design triggers that lead to good actions, you reward them right, and that you create investment in that habit to have an ongoing behavior. So Nir Eyal, N-I-R-E-Y-A-L, is a wonderful person if you want to learn about designing these engagement loops. If you want a successful business, though, you ultimately know what business are you in? What is that business model? What are those archetypes? And that's what I want to kind of walk through in this section. Uh, again, there's a lot of text here. I'm not going to cover it. I'm going to put the link uh, for this deck up on my Twitter so you can have all of this and read it. But there's classical business model archetypes. You've got, you know, product maker, your manufacturer. You could be a merchant. You could be a community distributor of content. Um, you could be a coach. You could be a trainer. These are classic business models. But really, what's worth asking is, what are you selling? Are you selling a product? Is it apparel? Is it supplements? Is it devices? Are you making that product? Is it your own brand? Or are you curating and collecting third-party products and selling them together? Are you selling software, apps, chatbots, maybe even AI? Are you a content vendor? Are you providing 
paid or ad-supported content. Or maybe you're a marketer. You're endorsing, you're an influencer, you're sponsoring, you're certifying things. There are many different things you could sell here, all the way down through you are producing paid events and gatherings. You could be a nonprofit. There's newer models. You could be selling tokens and cryptocurrency of what you're doing. You could even be selling money itself. You could be offering financing, lending, leasing, fundraising. These are all different types of things that you might be selling. But I kind of want to give you a little advanced tip. Did you ever play that game, the fortune cookie one, where you open your fortune, and at the end you tack on in bed? Um, this is sort of equivalent to what I've been thinking a lot about, about what business are you in that you think you're in, but what could you be in or should you be in? So instead of tacking the words in bed onto what you're doing, could you tack on the word as a service? So instead of selling devices or gadgets or wearables, could you sell it as a service? Instead of selling um, kind of supplements, could you sell it as an ongoing service, something that's recurring? So service business model types, this part I think is the future and can really help you turbo boost your business. There are the basic things we've seen in the self-help industry until now, which is help me track something, that's data, research, help me understand it, that's coaching, training, education. There's help me make something, which is design and manufacturing services, help me market it and promote it, advertising, influencers, but the big opportunity, you know how I talked about we're overloaded with too many choices? I think what we really need is to help people get away from just having tools and information and education to helping me do it. It's really offloading all of that, that work because um, even for me as a hardcore body hacker and then studying ketogenic diets and all these supplements, uh, the list of things to keep track of that Ben walked through, I took copious notes. There's at least 50 things there to do. But it's almost even easier if somebody takes away all my choice in the day and says, here is what you do, you have no choice. That's actually how celebrities, Fortune 500 executives, do so well. They have personal staff that removes choice, tells them what to do. They don't question it, they just follow it. So can you, for your business, instead of giving tools and information to just empower people, Ultimately, we're too busy, we might be a little bit lazy. Can you help them do it? Can you help me decide? More than that, can you help just do it for me? Can you offload it for me? Can I outsource it to you? Can you automate it for me? Once you get it for me, can you help me set it up? Can you manage it? Can you maintain it? Can you help me finance it? As an example, could, uh, instead of me buying it, could you just lease it to me? How many of you are basically Apple product addicts? You just buy whatever it comes out with. Instead of like having to worry about when it gets upgraded, wouldn't you just rather pay like a yearly subscription and have them send you the new thing? That's kind of an example for how businesses as a service can be recurring when it could be more rental and subscription. Plus, as it is, millennials and Gen Z, they don't want to own stuff. They want experiences. Buying crap actually creates more cognitive load because you've got to find places to store it. You've got to take care of it. It breaks. Reselling it and get rid of them is a pain in the ass. Who actually likes buying and owning furniture anymore? It's things like that, right? Um, the biggest one of all, help me tell my story and connect with others around it. That's ultimately what we're looking for. Figuring out your identity, helping you tell that story and connecting with others to see, does anybody else resonate with this? Is anybody else on the same journey? That is probably the biggest business opportunity of all. The ultimate business in longevity, I actually think longevity is not about more. It's not about more lifespan. It's about less and more quality. So less choices, less noise, less distraction, less calories, less fear, less busy work, less cognitive load. It's kind of a subtractive process. For those of you who meditate, have you noticed that it's something about getting rid of all these extra impulses, these distractions? It's the same thing also in fitness, in nutrition. It's cutting out the things that don't serve you well. Um, it's uh, enhancing your life, it's removing stories and narratives that no longer serve you. Ultimately, I think longevity is subtractive in its nature. So the real business, what we're really selling in here longevity, simplification, which can lead to the room to have empowerment, a transformation along the hero's journey. The keys, though, are with that process, helping people figure out their own story, their identity, and then forming a community or connecting with others around that. Long, long term, I actually think we might be headed towards a form of digital immortality from remember, think, and do it for me, all the way to remember me, characterize me, synthesize me, and then think and do as me. Imagine a chatbot that would be able to talk to your great grandkids in the same language that you use, that would be able to talk like you do, respond like you do, learn new information, integrate it, process it like you do. These technologies are already here. 
There's so much corpus of data. If you gave me your logins for your email, all your text message apps, all your social media, running a semantic analysis on that, I could probably synthesize a chatbot that could fool half the people into not knowing it's you on the other end of it. So these are kind of really interesting ways that we're approaching uh, another form of longevity, not just extending your biology, but maybe your consciousness itself. Some lessons learned. I'll give you an example. Um, I helped to found one of the first wearable companies, a heart rate tracker called Basis. Um, and we thought we were selling devices, but it turned out to be a lot harder than that because to build these connected devices, we had to build this Avengers-like team of all these different ninjas that came from different skill sets. If you're trying to do a business as a service, that means you might have to be able to build hardware, software, apps, data tracking, APIs, all these things that's kind of like running four or five companies in one. So you have to have talent that spans that range. A lot of these people might never have sat under the same roof before, so being able to recruit from across the spectrum is a skill set you'll need to have. Second, the notion of don't just build it and they will come. Maybe you could pre-sell it, you could crowdfund it, you could do an ICO around it on um, crypto. Um, it's a really interesting way to reduce your risk around it and test product theories before you have to invest in making stuff. Quick example, you could run just on your credit card a Facebook ad um, just to see would people sign up on a wait list before you actually commit to building something. You've got Kickstarter as well. Another thing I like to say is we're no longer in the business of getting customers and audiences. We're trying to build movements. You want communities that will have ongoing support for your product and ongoing demand after that crowdfunding campaign. You know that you have a community when users are sharing stories of how they use your product, service, event, whatever it is that you hadn't even thought of. If they come up with ways that it helps them, that they explain to others, that it wasn't even in your marketing copy, you're onto something there. Um, another advanced trick for you is bundling. This is a great way to add extra margin into your product. A lot of times you might think, oh, I'm selling a new supplement or I'm selling a new uh, tracker for my breath or whatever it is. Uh, humans, we are a little bit uh, kind of like lazy in nature, but we also kind of sometimes want the easiest decision-making um, uh, factors for us. So as an example, in your shopping cart, if you have sort of a basic plan, silver plan, gold plan, if you default it to the deluxe starter kit and you add extra straps and batteries and extra six months of subscription and buy one for a friend, most people will just accept that. And what's nice is those extra accessories, the extra battery packs and whatnot, it's usually pure profit margin and you can boost the amount that you're selling and people will default right to it. When people believe it's good for them, they simply want the best package. Another advanced trick from Dan Ariely, a great behavioral economist, is the notion of in your shopping cart, always have the VIP baller plan. And that might be the lifetime subscription or something like that for some outrageous price. You'll be surprised. 0.1% of your customers will convert and buy that thing. The secondary benefit, it will lift the next highest plan up by 7% conversion rate. That means if you had a gold plan, that'll go up by 7% because people will see the super lifetime baller plan and say, hmm. The gold plan is not too bad in comparison. So, so there's little tricks like that. As I talked about, think of everything as a service. Since software and services are eating everything, hardware, uh, consumer packaged goods, how can you make it a recurring service? It's more healthy for you as a business because you have more repeatability and forecastability as well. As we talked about before, many of us in this room do a lot of coaching. We do a lot of lifestyle design. Um, we do a lot of teaching. The notion is, instead of one-time coaching, can you, or a limited number of clients you can support, can you supplement that? Can you provide um, concierge-like services? Can you provide ongoing tracking? Can you use automation, machine learning, to help you scale up and support thousands of clients at once without degrading the quality of the connection you're offering people and giving yet around-the-clock service by automating some things? I'll give you one example. Text messaging with templates is a great way to do daily data collection. You ever notice if you're a teacher, you answer the same questions over again and you're just looking for input. How was your week? How was your day? Those things can be automated by bots, agents that can handle that for you. And then you, as that concierge, can look at the exceptions or the yellow flags as they pop up. Hence, you might be able to do 10x the number of clients that you could support otherwise before. One of the main points of this too is if you used to just sell data, know-how, information to people, it's good, but it doesn't really change behavior. People need the human touch. You need that other person who is your concierge, your coach, that adds a little bit of fear, a little bit of accountability. It gives you a bit of that bedside manner. So I've always found that this human touch of coaching is superior to just data, just dashboards, just the sort of information recipes. 
There's also this notion of the channel dance. Who are you actually selling to? Many of us here start with direct to consumer. We're doing uh, e-commerce, we're doing uh, infomercials, we're doing all those sorts of direct selling. But if you really want to scale your business, you might get to 10, 20, 30 million a year on direct to consumer, but where things really start to explode to the 100 million level is then when you start to be able to sell to employers. The thing is, if consumers like it, Employees and HR benefits managers will look at it and say, I need that for my employees. That's what happened to companies like Fitbit and others. And if employers start buying it in bulk and offering it to employees as a subsidized uh, sort of purchase, more employees will pick it up. And if employees and employers really pick up, insurers and payers will start to look at it. And that's how your business can turn into the billions of dollars mark. But it's an interesting channel dance that you start with consumer that goes to employers. If you get employers, that'll lead to the insurers and payers. Never go the other way around, because if you start trying to sell to the insurers and the healthcare system, you could just run out of money and be beating your head against the wall for years trying to crack into that, as opposed to getting organic adoption. So, got 10 minutes left. I'm going to buzz through some of these again. This is uh, going to be on the uh, deck that I'll put out for everyone to see. But in commerce, what are the opportunities? I still think there's a lot of room for all of us entrepreneurs in the room to make money outside of just selling against Amazon. Selling for Amazon against Amazon is tough. They always win if you know what you want to buy. The good news, half the time you want to buy something, you're doing it for entertainment or discovery, you don't know the exact SKU or model that you want. And that's the opportunity to win against Amazon, right? It's when people are buying for entertainment, self-expression, when they want artisanal or custom goods. Um, when they want unique brands that are collectibles or handmade that aren't available on Amazon. Or the other model we talked about, Instead of buying stuff, maybe they just want to rent it or share it or try it as opposed to owning, right? And this is where I think us as entrepreneurs should focus. The playbook that we've had in Mayfield is something I call the three C's. And this is great for next generation commerce and service and product companies. It used to be you focused on one of these three C's. The first one being, are you a content company or a curator? Do you tell people what's cool? That's the old magazine business. Here's what's new, here's what's coming. The second C is you might be a community, like a Reddit or those old forums like homemavyforum.com where you'd host discussions about things where people could geek out about products. Or the third is you were a commerce company. You were actually selling this stuff. Today, to be a world-class company, you might actually do all three of these. It's like you are the magazine, you are the online discussion forum, and you are the marketplace all in one. If you can do that, you get a really wonderful virtuous cycle around how your business operates. There are also six other emerging Cs, which are kind of fun, that I, that I encourage people to look at. Crowdsourcing, the wisdom of the crowd. Your users might know your product or what to build better than you do. Get their input, deputize them, recruit them as the merchandiser, the buyer, maybe even the designer of your next product or service. If they do that, they'll even pre-buy it. They'll do pre-sales, they'll crowdfund, and tell you that they're ready to buy, right? If you are building a community out of your users, they also want to trade with each other. So this notion of C to C marketplaces. Enthusiasts, passionate customers, they want to buy, sell, trade their stuff with each other and do a lot of shared storytelling in the process. You can offer coaching and concierge on top of this to help people manage their lifestyle, offload decisions, tell them what to get, buy it for them, set it up for them, do it for them. We're going to have then conversational commerce, chat bots, messaging bots, which help automate that process to be in touch like Scarlett Johansson in that movie, Her, talking to your customers around the clock all the time, hearing their stories, interpreting them, telling them back what is it that they're actually looking for, what should they get next. And then cryptocurrency. Maybe your next company is an network protocol. Maybe it's tokenized. Maybe you do an ICO on it instead of a traditional corporate model. Um, if you are in the product and service business, I highly encourage you to see if you can make first-party products, have your own brand over time. Even if you just do kind of a private label, maybe you start by curating other great products, but then you start to introduce some of your own brands on top of it. Costco has done this then with Kirkland brands. Best Buy has done this with uh, their Rocketfish brands. It's wonderful to build up uh, more pro to build more profit margin and more exclusive products you couldn't find on Amazon. So how do you know if you've got a good business? Key metrics. What are the numbers that can tell if your business is scaling pretty well? Well, it's not just the amount of revenue. A lot of entrepreneurs will pitch me and say, I'm doing 100 million of revenue a year. But the real question is, what's the quality of that revenue? Quality is defined as, what are your gross profit margins? And the real litmus test is what is known as a contribution margin. After you strip away marketing costs, warehousing costs, returns, credit card processing fees, all those sorts of things, what is the actual contribution margin 
profit that comes to that. If you're doing over 20%, that's a world-class business. If you've got high gross profit margins of north of 50%, it's a good way to start. But if you're only selling other people's products and Amazon has squished you down to like 10, 20% gross margins, that's really tough. That's like basically living on oxygen-deprived kind of a lifestyle right there. The other notion is to grow your business, there's something called a payback period versus your CAC. CAC is your customer acquisition cost. How much money does it take for you to get a paying customer? How much do you have to spend on Facebook ads, Google, et cetera? And then how long does it take you to get that recovered? World-class metrics are if you can, on this contribution margin basis, pay back your cost of acquisition within three to six months, you're doing something really well. If it takes you a year, two years to get back that acquisition costs, that's really tough because of what that means, you get this growing gap between how much you grow versus how much you're returning your, your investment on getting new customers. The other health metric is how long does it take to double your cost of acquisition. If you can do it in 12 to 18 months, that's pretty strong. And then my favorite hack of all, instead of one-time purchases, can you turn every customer into a recurring revenue opportunity? Could you do subscriptions? Can you do bundles? Can you be a leaser, a financer, uh, a lender? If you can do that, you get this wonderful repeating and building revenue stream instead of just a one-time episodic kind of sale. If you are selling products or services, see if you can get this mix between your own produced brand and maybe curated products somewhere in the 50-50. Um, why not just do 100% first party? Actually, something we found is if you're trying to get more share of wallet in a category, let's say you're doing organic soaps or something like that, you uh, will expand your share of wallet if you've got a good mix of your own products that are unique that stand out. That helps people remember you and you have uh, competition power against Amazon. But if you also can curate the other stuff they want from other brands, you will eventually capture more share of wallet in that category for them. So something we've seen that's really powerful, if your mix is 50% your own unique products, 50% curated products which fit the customer need, you get more share of that category and your overall profit margins go up. Some other key metrics. How addicted are you to paid acquisition? How much do you have to spend on Facebook ads um, to get more users? Ideally, if you could be doing 50% of your traffic or your business through organic channels, meaning word of mouth, referrals, non-paid, that's a really, really good sign. It could be that you've got a movement going on. Um, if you are doing paid acquisition, try not to be just dependent on Facebook or Google. In fact, ever since Facebook's been criticized for a lot of the data hacks they've had, Facebook paid spend is actually going up in terms of how much it costs to get a new user because they're able to use less and less targeting. A lot of our companies have seen the cost of acquisition on Facebook is going up that, that paid acquisition spend per user because they're unable to target as much. They have to be very careful with how much data they're using now. Can you use other uh, channels like Instagram, Reddit? Nextdoor is one that hasn't been thought about a lot, but there are other platforms out there you could use for paid acquisition. Okay. Uh, like I said before, community effects. You know you're doing well if it's not just a customer you have, but you're inviting them to share their stories. How do you use the product? What other products do you use it with? What is your setup? What's your configuration? Because um, really, if you think about it, your customer's journey, their experience begins when they get that box from you, when they get that beginning of that service. You want to invite them to share their story because they'll recruit with others. And your product is really meant to help them figure out their story, their identity, how they improve themselves with it. There's a lot of case studies here. Some of my favorites are Peloton. You would have thought it was just a simple fa fancy exercise bike, but it's really exercise bike as a service. It's useless without the cloud-connected classes, and so they're really a subscription company. Um, same thing with e-commerce. Companies like Trunk Club, Dollar Shave Club, they turn their customers into repeat subscribers instead of just one-time purchasers. Um, in the world of longevity and precision wellness, Illumina has created mass genetic sequencing for everybody, bringing it pretty close now. We're well under 1000 bucks. We're probably approaching $100 per genetic sequence. This opens up all new personalized wellness opportunities for your gut biome like you biome. Companies like Helix, where they'll take your genetic sequence and then try to personalize everything from your supplements to the food to the fitness regimen you should have. Right? Uh, we've got new businesses going on in brain training and mindfulness, meditation that's tech-enabled, companies like Lumosity, Headspace, Calm.com. These are all companies that have shown you can scale up to $100 million of subscription revenue by helping people with their transformation each day. We've talked about next-gen foods and smart drugs, all these different kind of um, companies providing products that are replenishables and will likely be subscription business as well. 
And then uh, my favorite is in the coaching world. Many of us in this room do a lot of coaching and behavior change. There are companies like Retrofit, Waybetter, Strava that have shown how you can combine technology and in-person connection and community to really scale up and build up coaching businesses. I'm going to end on this. What is really at stake? Why are we trying to build business and longevity? Why is it so important? I think that we've got one big disease that business uh, is, is really stuck on, and this, this notion of growth. We're addicted to growth, that things should keep growing. We should sell more, produce more, consume more. The thing is, the only thing that grows nonstop in nature is cancer until it kills the host organism. I think we need to move beyond mindless consumption. And so what we're trying to do is rewrite what are markets, what are corporations, are we moving more towards things that can help us share more, reuse more, maybe spend less, but spend more wisely, spend better. Remember that notion of getting rid of too many choices and getting down to what serves you the most. If anything, I think we're in a battle with our monkey and our lizard brains that always wants more, wants more sex, more novelty, more calories. We're trying to shift from the scarcity mindset to this abundance mindset. I think that's what future businesses will be built on. And if anything, it's maybe hitting a planetary equilibrium because basically, let's face it, we got 30 years to figure out how to feed 12 billion plus people when we have a planet that mathematical models show support three to four billion people maybe. So really, I think with longevity, with this uh, conscious te technology, it's our duty as a species. We're trying to reach the next rung of the evolutionary ladder. And to do that, we've got to get beyond this current adolescence phase we have when we're addicted to more stuff, more production, more content, more news. Um, what we really want, I think, the mission, as Ben talked about, knowing your purpose, is your business helping everybody do one of three things I think humans were put on this planet to do? First, heal whatever trauma or challenge that superhero kind of existential crisis you're facing. It might even be whatever you inherited from your parents or their parents before them. If you can help them heal and understand that, you give people the freedom to figure out what is their truest form of play, what is that makes them feel most alive, they were put here to do, puts them in that flow state. And then the biggest hack of all, if you can turn your play into something beyond ego, beyond achievement, into a form of service, that I think is the biggest playbook of all. And that in many ways is invaluable and is actually when people take what they're put here to do and use it as a form to help the rest of the world have it as a gift and offering to the whole universe itself. So I hope that is helpful for folks and thank you very much for your time.